Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India everybody this is dr vishal trivedi from department of biosciences and bioengineering iit guwahati and so far what we have discussed we have discussed about different processes like uh, what are you should follow and we should not follow while you are doing the gel filtration chromatography to explain you this in a more detail we have prepared a demo uh, sessions where we are going to take you to my lab and where one of my student is going to show you how to pack this column, how to pack the gel filtration column, how to determine the uh, molecular weight using the uh, different types of approaches what we are going to discuss in a subsequent slides and how you can actually exploit the or detect the different types of problems in the gel filtration column such as how to detect the air bubbles, how to detect the air channels and all other kind of problems and what if you are getting some kind of problems, how to troubleshoot those problems in the column packaging itself. In this video, we will demonstrate how to perform gel filtration chromatography or size exclusion chromatography. There are various methods are available in chromatography to separate different types of biomolecules. For example, if you want to separate based on size or shape, it is called as gel filtration chromatography which suits the most. If you want to separate the molecules based on their charge, then you can go for the uh, ion exchange chromatography. So uh, these are uh, various methods are available. But in this video, we are mainly focusing on the gel filtration or size exclusion chromatography. What is uh, gel filtration chromatography? There is two phases in this process. One is stationary phase, another one is uh, mobile phase. Stationary phase mainly a matrix, cross liquid matrix. For example, we can use uh, dextran or uh, another name of dextran is uh, sepadex. This is highly cross liquid uh, glucose molecules or we can use agarose, this is also cross liquid or we can use polyacrylamides. But in this video, we are showing Sepadix G75, this is the stationary phase we are using. So in this matrix, it contains beads which having small pores. So if you want to separate a mixture of molecules starting from uh, 1 kDa to suppose uh, uh, 200 kDa. So, the small molecule which is 1 kda it will permeate through or diffuse into the pores in the beads and the bigger molecule having the 200 kda it will excluded from the retaining in the, that uh, portion of uh, pores so it will elute first and the smaller molecule will retain there and we have to give uh, sufficient buffer to elute that one so this is the overall concept of the gel filtration chromatography. It can be widely used as uh, used in uh, separation of proteins, peptides or uh, oligonucleotides. So in this video we will show you how to pack the column first and what are the buffers required. For uh, gel filtration chromatography there are two kinds of uh, columns available. One is pre-packed columns and another one is column material which can be used for the packing of the column. Here we will show you uh, how to pack a column and also we have pre-packed column. At the bottom of the column there should be a centered filter in pre-packed columns which will 
uh, for bit going of the bits uh, through uh, outlet so here if you see in uh, pre packed columns there is some sintered filter bottom of the column in both the ways uh, outlet and inlet both contains the sintered filters inlet which is mainly uh, from buffer inlet if there is any particles which will obstruct the flow they will be separated on top and also uh, the outlet one which can be used preventing passage of the beads through uh, outlet so here we don't don't have exactly sintered filter but we can use a piece of cotton so just put the cotton So now we inserted the cotton. These are the beads we are going to use for cutting up the column. These are severed X or 75 beads. So there are different materials available. Sucralose, severed X, separos. These all are derivatives of uh, a carbohydrate material. So here what we will do, this is a overnight solid beads. So you have to uh, take the beads uh, complete back and they incubate uh, soak it in the water or the buffer so these are uh, sole in one now after inserting the uh, this center filter or column you have to wash column properly at least two to three column volumes with the distilled water so if anything uh, it contains like dust or uh, any other contaminating particles it will remove. Now we directly pour the beads on top of the column. If we close, uh, if you observe closely, you can see the settling of the columns. Okay, settling of the beads. As we can see, the beads are settling slowly. So, after completely complete settling of the beads, then we will put some filtered kind of thing or some piece of cotton on top of the beads. Then we will load the sample. As we can see now the packing is over. Uh, now what we have to do is we have to equilibrate the column with the uh, 0.05 molar phosphate buffer. So we will just add phosphate buffer. and remove drain the uh, any uh, unbound solvent so here after equilibration of the column we will load the sample after column packing you have to check uh, the efficiency of the column so uh, for every column uh, the parameters v naught that is void volume and vt total volume and uh, the elution volume it differs so for checking of the column efficiency we have to use 0.2 percentage of total volume of the column 
uh, acetone we will load. So we have to observe uh, the emission at 280 nanometers. From this we can calculate number of theoretical plates n. So the maximum number of the theoretical plate means the more the efficiency. For calculation of any unknown protein's molecular weight, we should know what is the Vt, V0 and Ve. Vt is the total volume of the column, means the buffer occupied in the spaces of beads and also the buffer in between the beads. So that, that will be uh, total volume. The void volume is the buffer in between the beads. Emission volume is uh, where the elute, suppose we are eluting uh, protein. So at what volume it is eluting? That is uh, called as emission volume. So for estimating the void volume, uh, we can use blue dextran. So first we have to cover top with the piece of cotton then we will load the blue dextran. After loading, sample loading, we will start collecting the uh, buffer till blue dextran completely eluted. That will give the wide volume. So now we loaded the blue dextran. We will add the buffer, then we, then we will elude. So as we can see the blue dextran is passing down. So we have to replenish buffer continuously and we start collecting the, uh, the eluted volume. So after complete addition of the blue dextran, uh, we have to measure the volume and that volume gives us wide volume. Now the blue dextran completely eluted, it was, it is around uh, uh, 18 to 19 mm. So now we got wide volume, now what about total volume? Total volume consists of the uh, packed volume of the beads, total packed volume of the beads. So it is around uh, 25 ml of uh, beads are there. So that means total volume is 25 ml. So with these values, after uh, eluting the protein, suppose if you are using some unknown protein, you have to calibrate with the, for uh, known proteins, then you have to construct a calibration curve between the partition coefficient which is calculated by uh, elution volume uh, subtracted with uh, wide <coughs> volume divided by uh, total volume subtracted wide volume that will give partition coefficient and uh, on x axis you have to take uh, log molecular weight once you plot you will observe some correlation based on that you can calculate unknown proteins molecular weight. So uh, this is the gel filtration column attached to protein purification system. So here what we will show you, uh, we will inject the blood extract and BSA and show, the, show their pattern, how they are empty. This blood extract gives a wide volume of the column and also BSA gives actual uh, elution pattern. So if you run few more proteins with known molecular weight, we will get the uh, calibration curve with that we can calculate unknown proteins molecular weight. So this column is equilibrated as we can see here, uh, when we introduce it into buffer uh, after removing 20% ethanol and uh, water also. So we can see this is this one corresponds to blue line corresponds to uh, uh, 280 nanometer 
which is uh, relevant to protein one so we can see we have there is a initial spike but uh, gradually it the line uh, the curve flat flattened so that means uh, there is no contaminants and now the column is ready to inject the protein so what we will do we will inject the protein and we will show how to inject protein also then we will the uh, show the pattern they are eluting so here we will end the program so we will start the new program system flow will keep Point five ml per minute insert flow path column position at one and downward flow insert monitors we need three different uh, wavelengths 215 for uh, peptide bond 254 for nucleic acid and 280 for aromatic amino acids and uh, we have to set the alarms also uh, we'll set this 3 and this one 0 1 complete system pressure 3 and this one 0 1 so we will inject the protein now then we will see how it's This is the port where we are going to inject the uh, uh, sample. So once we will inject this one, and uh, execute, inject. Uh, components this one corresponds to the uh, blue dextran and it gives the wide volume uh, of 8 ml uh, as we can see here it corresponds to 8 ml so there is no proper resolution between uh, BSA and the blue dextran this corresponds to 8 ml which is blue dextran and this one is the 9.2 to 9.5 this corresponds to the uh, uh, BS. So once this is finished, we have to run another one column of in buffer to remove any uh, other proteins. And after that, we will uh, keep it in uh, keep it in water. So to remove any uh, kind of salts if present then we will keep it the 20 percent ethanol uh, we will run at least uh, one column value so that directly we can use to preserve the column after that we have to purge with the 20 percent ethanol complete system so that uh, there is no uh, contamination or bacterial growth uh, if you left for few days also so this is all about uh, uh, gel filtration chromatography so we will show you how to analyze the result so once the gel filtration run is over we have to analyze the results so this is the software we will use for the uh, evaluation purpose so we have to open the uh, the chromatogram which you want to analyze so we already opened this is the chromatogram we run recently so we have to analyze uh, peaks so peak integrate option is there so just say uh, which one you want to analyze 
uh, UV 280 nanometer one or 215 we have all, only 281 so that's let's say analyze so as we can see it gave uh, the retention volumes of the peaks and also the area and the height of the peak these values can be used for constructing calibration curve this one belongs to blue dextral and this one is uh, for bs so uh, in a summary in this video we showed how to uh, run a gel filtration we showed manually how to tap the column with the beads and also connecting through instrument so hope this will help uh, for your research to improve your research now let us see the application of gel filtration chromatography. Apart from uh, purification, the gel filtration chromatography is being extensively used for determination of molecular weight. As you remember, we have just discussed that the molecular weight is related to the number of residues which this particular protein is going to have and the number of residues are also directly related to the radius of gyration which means the radius of gyration is directly proportional to the molecular weight. This is a formula. The molecular weight and radius of gyration is irreversibly related which means Rg is directly proportional to the Ma. So, Rg is directly proportional to Ma and where A is a constant which depends on the shape of the molecule. A is 1 for rod, A is 0.5 for coils and A is 0.33 for spherical submolecules. Which means if you plot a graph between radius of gyration versus the molecular weight and radius of gyration is directly proportional to the elution volume or Ve. This means the Ve is going to be inversely proportional to the molecular weight. So, to determine a molecular weight what you are going to do is you can calibrate this column simply by running the proteins of different molecular weight and then you plot this. So, that will give you a calibration curve between the log molecular weight and the distribution coefficient Kd of all these individual proteins uh, which you are using for calibration and all these proteins are globular in nature that is why they are going to follow the basic principle of gel filtration. Then what you do is you suppose you do the same exercise and calculate the Ve and then you calculate the Kd value of your unknown protein suppose this is your unknown protein that actually will give you the log molecular weight and then you can calculate from this log molecular weight you can be able to calculate the molecular weight of that particular protein. Now in this particular experiments or in this particular type of exercise what you do not know is about the void volume. So, the void volume how to calculate the void volume? Now as we said for detecting the air channels you have to have a molecule which actually has a Kd value equal to 1 whereas to calculate the VD, v, VO which means the void volume you have to have a molecule which is the Kd value of 0 which means in that case only the elution volume is equivalent to the void volume. How to get a molecule which has a Kd value equal to 0? Now to answer this question you can understand that most of these uh, gel filtration chromatography columns are only working with the globular proteins which means they are not going to work with the fibrous proteins. So, there are two different types of protein. One is globular protein which are ball like proteins which actually maintains the all the residues along with the center whereas there are fibrous proteins which are actually not following this particular rule. The, one of the classical example of globular protein is hemoglobin. The hemoglobin the molecule which actually ca carry the oxygen from one part of the body to another part. The classical example of the fibrous protein is the hair which we have and this the purpose of the globular protein and the fibrous proteins are very different. The globular proteins are mostly pro the protein which are actually taking part in the enzymatic reactions or all sort of metabolic reactions whereas most of the fibrous proteins are part of the uh, structural proteins such as the uh, collagen or the fibrous uh, keratin or all other protein which are actually fo forming this like uh, the protein which is making the nails. So, if you take any protein 
which is of fibrous in nature which what is mean by fibrous in nature is that it is going to be of an extended conformation. Suppose you take your hair, the hair are of fiber like structure that is why the name is known as the fibrous protein. So, if you take a structure which is of fibrous in nature that fibrous structure is not going to enter into this particular bead irrespective of the size. So, one of the easiest fibrous structure is instead of taking it protein what you can do is you can take a sugar chain, you can take a sugar polymer and sugar polymers are also present in the extended conformation. So, they will not going to enter into the beads. One of the classical example of the sugar what people use is the dextran. So, you can use the dextran and because you want to detect this particular dextran what people do is they just stain this particular dextran with a blue dye and that is why the name is saying is blue dextran. So, if you load the blue dextran onto the column, the blue dextran is going to be excluded from the column because it is in the extended conformation and the it will exhibit the KD value which is equivalent to 0 which means the VE is going to be your VO and in that case you can just get the elution volume of the blue dextran and that is going to be the wide volume of this particular column under that particular condition which means if you change the pH, if you change the temperature, if you change the packaging both for wide volume as well as the KD values everything will going to be changed. So, all these change things are relative whether it is wide volume or KD values. So, as soon as you change the packaging and all other conditions all these parameters are going to be changed which means the calibration curve is also not going to be hold for that particular column. You also have to draw the again new calibration curves if you would like to determine the molecular weight. So, as long as the column is maintaining the particular type of packaging you can keep using this calibration curve, but if you change the conditions you have to redraw the calibration curves to precisely calculate the molecular weights. Now, once you calculated the molecular weight, you could also be able to calculate the oligomeric status of the protein. What is mean by oligomeric status is that either it is uh, one monomer which means one particular chain is going to be part of the protein or the two chain are going to be attached to each other. So, in this case the the uh, oligomeric status is monomeric whereas in this case the allomeric status could be the homodimeric status or the heterodimeric status which means it could be either NN or MM or it could be NM. So, this is the heterodimer this is these two are called as the homodimer similar it could be tetramer it could be pentamer. So, all so how many subunits are associating with each other and giving you the final protein is called as the oligomeric status of that particular protein. So, once you calculate the molecular weight of these protein utilizing the method just now what we have discussed, then what you can do is you can also calculate the molecular weight using the SDS page. So, SDS page is going to give you the denaturating conditions which means in the case of the monomeric protein it will give you the molecular weight of N whereas the gel filtration is going to give you the molecular weight of NN which means if you divide the NN from the N it will say that the, the uh, oligomeric status is 2 which means dimer. So, the molecular weight which you are getting from the gel filtration if you divide that by the molecular weight which you are getting from the SDS page that will give you the oligomeric status. Uh, now, the next is you can study the protein folding by the gel filtration. You know that once it is generated as a small extended conformation, it gets uh, into the native conformation, which gets folded and then it rearranges all the amino acids. If you put them under the denaturating conditions such as the uh, uh, urea, so if you put it under 2 molar urea, it is going to be a partially folded protein. If you put it under the 4 molar urea, it is going to be unfolded further but if you put it under the 8 molar urea it is going to be completely unfolded which means this is going to be the extended conformation 
uh, this is going to be extended which means this will behave like a fibrous protein this is going to be behave like a globular protein and we are only talking about the globular protein so the protein structure has the multi level organization primary structure which is the sequence of the protein secondary structure which means alpha helix and beta sheets and turn and the tertiary and the quaternary structure when the protein is incubated with the increasing concentration of denaturating agents such as urea or gdm cl it unfolds the native structure into the unfolded extended conformation for uh, following the different types of steps sometime the proteins are getting unfolded completely sometime they are getting unfolded domain wise so that's why there's no universal law that the protein unfolding is going to follow a particular pattern uh, so once if you would like to study that the protein is incubated with the different concentration of urea which is from 0 to 8 molar for 8 to 10 hours at 37 degrees celsius a gel filtration column if you would like to use gel filtration column is also equilibrated with the buffer containing the urea which is of same concentration which which means for this particular concentration you are going to run the, the gel filtration with buffer which contains the 2 molar urea in this one it is going to contain the 4 molar urea so the sample also you are going to prepare in this particular denaturating conditions the column is also going to run in the same buffer uh, and then you uh, mixture is analyzed as the concentration of the denaturating agent is increasing the protein will unfold with the increase in hydrodynamic surface area which means if the protein is in a native conformation it is going to make a compact ball as soon as you are putting under the denaturating conditions it is getting unfolded and that's why that the diameter of that particular ball is increasing and ultimately is going to form a extended conformation as a result the protein peak shifts towards the left which means this is the peak for the native conformations and as the size of the peak will go the protein will come out more and more uh, onto the left side at highest concentration of the denaturant the protein unfolds completely and mostly appear in the void volume that is what we said this if this is a extended conformation present just like as a fibrous protein so this particular particular protein is going to be come out into the wide volume whereas these two are the uh, intermediate stages which are corresponding to the uh, partially folded uh, proteins and this is the native proteins now you can also study the protein ligand interactions so ligand binding to the protein induces conformational changes results into the change in size or shape in addition ligand is small in size so the ligand if you analyze the ligands uh, it is going to uh, elute at a different size if you study the proteins it is also going to elute at a different size so the ligand which is small in size the protein which is also small in size if you put them together and if they make a complex that complex is going to be of large uh, hydrodynamic surface area whereas the protein ligand complex is big and may appear at a distinct place in the column so in the step one what you do is a gel filtration column is equilibrated with the buffer and the elution profile of ligand is recorded so in the first step what you do is you equilibrate the column and then you study the, uh, the elution of the ligand only then what you do is now column is equilibrated with the buffer containing the ligand molecules and you can use the different concentration of the ligand so as the concentration of the ligand is increased the protein binds to these ligands and they are going to start forming the complexes of different sizes and uh, with the increase so they will form the complexes with the increase in hydrodynamic surface area as a result the protein peaks shifts towards the left so you can see uh, when you are analyzing the ligand it is uh, it is uh, making a separate peak but when you are resolving the proteins onto a column which also contains the ligands the protein is forming a complex with the ligand and that's how the ligand peak is shifting towards the protein side and you can actually calculate the dissociation constant simply because after some time it is not going to migrate and that is the place where it is going to saturate so the number of ligand molecules which are going to bind this particular protein is fixed so suppose you are resolving a one micromolar of protein so it and the stoichiometry of interaction between the protein and ligand is 1 is to 10 then it is going to interact up to 10 micromolar with the ligand but 
Once you increase that particular concentration and you go to 20 micromolar, 30 micromolar or 50 micromolar, the remaining amount is going to be formed the separate peaks as a ligand. So, in that case when you resolve that what will happen is the protein ligand complex is going to appear and then you will see that the ligand is reappearing uh, in that particular condition. That means that now this is the stage at which the protein is fully saturated with the ligand and if you use these particular values you could be able to calculate the dissociation constant of the ligand protein interactions. So, as the concentration will increase with a fixed amount of the protein, the free ligand will appear in the chromatogram. The protein amount and the concentration at which the free ligand appeared and the dilution data can be used to calculate the stoichiometric ratio of ligand protein and the equilibrium constant which means you can be able to calculate the dissociation constant Kd. Uh, the protein you can also use for protein desalting. So, you know that sometimes the protein is being purified by uh, for example, if you are purifying a protein using the ion exchange chromatography, you are actually putting lot of salt and that salt is you are using to for illusions. Now, if you if in a subsequent step suppose you would like to do the uh, enzymatic reaction and that salt is going to interfere or suppose you want to use this protein for any other application and this salt is. Uh, going to interfere into the, your analysis, then you have to remove this salt and there are multiple ways in which you can remove this salt. One of the way is that you can put this uh, dialysis of this particular protein against the buffer. If you do a dialysis, the salt is going to be exchanged along with the water and that is how the water will come in and the salt is going to be removed. But the dialysis is a very, very small step. So, in case some proteins are uh, prone for degradation or some proteins are getting inactivated, if you are going to continue this process for 10 hours or 12 hours. In those cases, we are also using the gel filtration chromatography to remove the salt because salt is nothing but the small molecules compared to the protein which is of large molecules. So, if you inject the protein onto a gel filtration column, the protein is going to form a separate peak and the salt is going to form the separate peaks. So, because salt is small in size, it will going to come and it will sit into the bottom of the beads whereas, the protein will go and bind to the other sides. So, because of that a gel filtration column is equilibrated with the buffer or water and then the sample for desalting is loaded. After the run the protein and salts are elute separately as a peak. So, if you elute the protein will come on first and the salt is going to come the later on. So, you can collect these proteins big amount and you can be that is how your protein is going to be separated from the salt and uh, this protein can be used for downstream applications. So, now with this we have uh, already discussed about the ion exchange chromatography, we have discussed about hydrophobic interaction chromatography and we have discussed about the gel filtration chromatography and uh, so, so far we have discussed about the all these three chromatography techniques which people are very oftenly use for protein purification as well as the characterization of the proteins. Uh, in general people are uh, running the ion exchange chromatography first followed by the hydrophobic interaction chromatography and followed by the gel filtration chromatography. The reason is that ion exchange chromatography requires the protein to present without salt whereas, the hydrophobic interaction chromatography requires the high salt concentration. So, the fraction which you elute from the ion exchange chromatography already contains salt. This means you can directly load those uh, those um, those fractions without going through a process of dialysis or desalting into the hydrophobic interaction chromatography and once the sample which you are going to get from the hydrophobic interaction chromatography is going to be of low salt because if you remember the elution conditions for the hydrophobic interaction chromatography is that we are decreasing the salt. So, your sample or the fraction which actually will contain your protein are going to have the low salt conditions and then you can directly load those low salt con uh, proteins onto the gel filtration column to purify or to characterize. Now, in the uh, subsequent lecture we are going to discuss about the affinity chromatography and we are going to discuss about how to generate the affinity columns and we are going to take up different examples of affinity chromatography. So, with this I would like to 
conclude our lecture here. In the subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss about the affinity chromatography. Thank you.